Okay, and we are back for the second hour here of Monday, July 27th, starting Chapter 25, Part 1 of 25. Homework 9 will be due tonight because we just finished 24, right? And chapter or uh, quiz seven is due tomorrow. You'll have time after recitation and office hours to get some help as needed. And then keep in mind, test three is lurking out there. Well, it's coming right up. It is this week. And it's a Friday test day this time. So, yeah, chapters 23 through 25 there uh, for test three coming up over those uh, that we just finished. So we need to do chapter 25, a means here. Now, we've already looked at these functional groups. In fact, we've been using these as intermediates for a number of reactions already. Way back in 351, we saw amines as neutral but strong nucleophiles, right? And there's different substitution patterns here and naming, so we'll go over that. Some aromatic ones and even the ammonium salts, which are the quaternary uh, ones there, they're charged. And some heterocycles. I've already had you learn a couple of those, pyridine, parole, imidazole. Uh, so we'll revisit some of those. Talk about their properties a little bit, especially basicity. So they are pretty good bases. The pKa of the conjugate acid is 9. Okay, so that's low enough to be within the pH scale range, right? So we've already talked about the ionization potential and the different states there. If we're below that pKa of 9 in the acidic range compared to that, say at, at 5 or 7 even, neutral water, they're mainly protonated. But if we're up in the basic side of their pKa, up around 12 or 14, whatever, then it's the neutral form, okay? So you need to know uh, about your ionization strength compared to the pH scale. We'll see some examples here. I've already shown you some, uh, but we'll look at an extensive list, I think, of the alkaloids, different drugs, and neurotransmitters. Yeah, there's eight of those I expect you to know. If you're going to work in the healthcare field, uh, you should be aware of the structures and properties of those eight, the main uh, major neurotransmitters, and they fit into the principles and the topics we're covering here in this chapter. So uh, it's not a stretch to have you uh, learn at least the basics about uh, the neurotransmitters. Synthesis, we're going to talk about uh, the ways to make different amines. We've already seen a lot of those. And then alkylation, oh, that's back to SN2 chemistry from 351. Yeah, we'll show you a variation to get clean uh, uh, primary amine production using the thal imid, the Gabriel synthesis approach. So that's the only new reaction there. And then we'll talk about reductive amination. Now this is using a hydride, now sodium cyanoborohydride, with an aminium ion that we can form from an amine and an aldehyde or ketone. This is analogous to hydrogenation with palladium and hydrogen, but it's simpler now, just sodium cyanoborohydride with the amine and the aldehyde, and that goes directly to the reduced, what, amine, okay? So it reduces that aminium ion. Basicity, some more details there. We need to uh, relate that to some structures here. Aromatic amines, anilines are less basic, so their conjugate acids are what? More acidic, okay? So there's a converse relationship between acid acidity and basicity. Normal alkyl amines are similar to ammonium. They're around 9, 10, whatever. If it's an alkyl amine, it's a little bit more basic, uh, a little bit less acidic than, than, than a normal uh, ammonium uh, salt there. But we'll need to talk about resonance and where the lone pairs are that are being protonated in these heterocyclic structures. And these relate to a lot of amines in biology. We've already talked about that when we did acidity uh, and uh, aromaticity. Yeah, it's a key component of that. So we'll review that. Amines as nucleophiles. Yeah, with uh, ketones, um, Lewis acids, Friedel crafts. No Friedel crafts on aniline, but we'll see a way around that via the aromatic amide. Okay. Hoffman elimination. Only if we have time, you can read about that. That's a way to give the less substitute alkene upon E2 elimination via the quaternary ammonium salt. And it's because it's bulkier. 
So then when you use hydroxide base, it actually forms the less substitute alkene. That's a counter Zaitsev uh, rule from 351. I don't know if we'll have time. It's a very simple reaction. It has to do with the E2 elimination. Here's the new stuff, really, in this chapter. It's nitrosation. So forming the aryl uh, diazonium salt from the aniline, okay, the primary aniline aromatic amine, if you treat that with nitrous acid, which is HONO, <laughs> and at this point in the uh, term or semester, students have already been saturated with too many reactions, and all of a sudden we throw another reaction at you, and the reaction of you is, oh no, oh no. Okay, yeah, that, that's a new reagent. That's the lower oxidized form of the nitrogen acid. It's, it's related, of course, to nitric acid, but this is nitrous acid. So it's HONO, lower oxidation state. It forms the nitrosonium cation, okay, or the nitrocel cation, uh, different than when we did nitrosation forming the aromatic nitro compounds with nitric acid. That was NO2 plus electrophile. So it's a different electrophile. And this will add to the uh, aromatic amine, the aniline, is nucleophilic enough to add to NO plus and then eliminate water to form the aryl diazonium salt. This is the key one here. Alkyl means will also form that, but they'll eliminate and do a lot of other things that are not very stable. The aromatic diazoniums can actually be isolated and then reacted with a number of nucleophiles here. So you can take your aromatic amine to the diazonium salt and then react with different nucleophiles. And here they all are, water, iodide, hydrogen tetrafluoroborate, uh, copper halides, copper cyanide, or hypophosphorus acid. And here you get phenol, here you get aromatic iodide, aromatic fluoride, aromatic halide, or cyanide. And here, hypophosphoric acid reduces the aryl diazonium to the benzene. <laughs> and that seems like a pretty degenerate reaction just to put back on a proton. Ah, but you can use the aromatic amine or the nitro to do other directing effects and then reduce it via the aryl diazonium down to the benzene. These are called the Sandmeyer reactions. Uh, we won't do the mechanisms of them. They're actually quite con controversial and somewhat unclear still, but I expect you know reactivity, how to convert any of these aryl diazonium salts into any of these products. And these are new products we haven't shown you how to make before. Phenol, Aromatic iodide, aromatic fluoride. Yeah, we learned about aromatic bromide and chloride from electrophilic aromatic substitution with chlorine or bromine and iron halides, right? But here uh, we're using iodide and fluoride to make those very useful aromatic halides. And then we can do other halides with the copper salts or the copper cyanide. Now that's a aromatic cyanide. We haven't shown you how to make that yet either. And then reducing to the benzene. Another reaction that these aromatic di diazonium salts do, if there's another more nucleophilic, more electron-rich aromatic benzene, it adds here and does electrophilic aromatic substitution on this ring to give this right here. So here's a new electrophile for more electrophilic aromatic substitution. And you see uh, this adds on there, substitutes for a hydrogen uh, at the ortho or the para position if it's a donor group, right? And it forms these diazo compounds. Now, these are stable compounds, fully conjugated through the nitrogen-nitrogen double bond in the two aromatic rings. These are dye molecules. These drop down into the visible range for absorption and uh, form all sorts of useful products. Uh, and I'll point some of those out there. And then uh, some are, are drug-related things. Prontosil is the precursor to sulfonanilin, the sulfa drugs that we showed you before. Uh, folic acid is the uh, target folic acid synthase for these drugs here, the sulfa drugs, uh, which mimics PABA, paraminobenzoic acid, which is the endogenous substrate leading to folic acid. So maybe we'll revisit uh, some of those, but diazodyes uh, are a lot of applications there. All right, so to catch your attention here and why these compounds are important, Amines are all over the place, especially in biology, especially in plants and, and microorganisms and uh, marine uh, uh, 
uh, products, uh, all sorts of producing agents in biology. And you've heard about a lot of these before. The tobacco plant produces nicotine, for example, a highly addictive substance. It's a stimulant, re relaxant, addiction issues. Uh, it's been used to uh, study these different receptors, the nicotinic acetylene choline receptors. It's an agonist there, histone deacetylase inhibition. It functions as a, uh, as a mimic of a number of endogenous substrates within, within the bodies of higher animals. It does have an LD50 value we just talked about there. Conine, hemlock, also very potent there. No known uh, applications of that. Nicotine used to be used <laughs> clinically for a couple of things here, but you, you might think, well, why do people smoke cigarettes? If it was just the bad taste and the uh, lung cancer, people wouldn't be smoking. Well, there are effects that nicotine engenders within the body that are pleasing to some people. Caffeine, similar thing. It's a xanthine from different plants. Uh, it has a similar type of structure to adenosine and guanosine uh, in DNA and RNA, those bases there. You see the trimethyl regions here. LD50 value is pretty high there. Central nervous stimulant, it's an adenosine mimic. It hits the adenosine receptor. Quinine, you probably heard about that. The malaria drug still used clinically all around the world. It does have an LD50 value there, but uh, it's very uh, good for treating the side effects actually of malaria. Atropine, you've probably heard of that compound too. It's a heart stimulant. Still used to treat people with acute uh, conditions of the heart, including heart attack. Comes from the belladonna, the deadly nightshade plant, or the mandrake plant. So this is kind of a Harry Potter compound right here. Uh, but yeah, it has a number of effects. Hits the muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptor as opposed to the nicotinic receptor. If you've had some neuroscience, those are the two main receptors in uh, neurons. And then we got morphine. We've been talking about that. That's the opioid receptor agonist, which controls pain. It's not very selective among mu, kappa, and delta. Uh, it does have tolerance and dependence issues, but it's still used frontline treatment for severe uh, pain. Uh, normally, you'll, you'll get that if you've had a bad injury or whatever, but they'll wean you off it to, to keep tolerance and dependence uh, at bay there. Codeine is also isolated from the poppy. It's the methyl ether version. You can convert morphine into codeine. Codeine has less uh, abundance in the plant, but uh, it has similar effects there. More specific for the delta opioid receptor. And again, all this kind of stuff you don't need to know. But the structure, right? These are tertiary amines. And at what? pH 7, these will be protonated. These are what? Ammonium salts even under neutral water conditions. And it's that ammonium salt that's part of the interaction with the receptor, actually. Cocaine, and we've mentioned that before, the diester here, also a tertiary amine. Thebane also comes from the poppy, a very minor component. The enantiomer of this is a number of stereocenters here. If you flip all these stereocenters, that uh, causes a depression. It's a depressant compound. Depresses uh, the... Uh, the central nervous system, which most of them do to, to control uh, things like coughing and other, yeah, anti-tussive. There's a, the effect of, of coughing. So oxycontin, naloxalone come from thebane, which undergo uh, hydrolysis of the vinyl ether to form a ketone at that spot. Oxycontin as a ketone. Okay, other alkaloids, sorry, this is probably too much. <laughs> Another atropine uh, compound here, mescaline from peyote cactus, hallucinogenic compounds. Uh, lysergic acid, dimethyl amide, that's a synthetic compound. The carboxylic acids, the uh, naturally thing out of ergot fungus, causes psychosis and hallucinations. It's the Salem witch trial uh, compound. So <laughs> a number of great stories about that compound. Saxitoxin, a very potent sodium channel blocker. This comes uh, from marine. Organisms there, shellfish poisoning, which pops up now and then. Psilocybin, uh, psilocin, magic mushroom compound causing hallucinations. These normal hallucinogenic compounds uh, hit the uh, uh, neurotransmitter receptor uh, of serotonin. They overstimulate that. Serotonin is the feel-good neurotransmitter, which you'll see later on. Huprazine, uh, interesting compound treating Alzheimer's. 
And yeah, Hall of Fame, some other <laughs> compounds here. Now, those alkaloids are all uh, alkaline basic plant derivatives from amines. They're usually tertiary amines. A lot of other amines, though, that we use that maybe aren't tertiary or from plants. Glyphosate is the herbicide compound. Indigo in uh, blue genes, that's the blue uh, compound. Mauve is purple in color, so a lot of dyes or amines. Uh, highly conjugated aromatic one. Aspartame, the sweetener, is a dipeptide. We'll talk about that more later when we get to the amino acid protein chapter. Capsaicin, anybody know where that comes from? Yeah, the pepper family. So if you've heard of the Scoville scale for hotness or heat in food, that's how much capsaicin is present. Uh, bell peppers have very little, uh, but habaneros and uh, and other uh, the ghost chili pepper, I think, is the world record holder right now, uh, is like a million or so on the Scoville scale. It's kind of an arbitrary scale, kind of a tongue-in-cheek type scale. There's no way to actually quantify it, uh, but it relates to how much this molecule is in those materials. Here's the potato chip compound, dimethylpyrazine, two nitrogens in benzene, uh, interesting flavorant. Then we got a dye here, uh, antibiotic, uh, Prozac, some other drugs here, erythromycin. Maybe we've talked about some of those before. Hall of Shame, caffeine, too much is added to drinks, overstimulating, uh, and that can be a problem. Uh, people with heart conditions who get too much caffeine, there are some clinical issues there. Then butylamine, putrescine, cadaverine. Well, the name says it all, don't you think? Two amines here on a straight chain thing. So we're here we're talking about the odor of these compounds. Skatol, I'll let you look that up on your own. Morphine, yeah, that can be abused and converted into the diacetyl, which is heroin. Methamphetamine, MDMA, that's molly, uh, hallucinogenic phenethylamine. Cocaine, nicotine, yeah, there's some others here. Uh, LSD. Uh, the hallucinant thalidomide, the birth defect causing agent. RU486, the abortifacient drug, causes abortions. And then we've got synthetic marijuana here. Uh, John H. Uh, Hoffman, compound 18. This is synthetic marijuana. Has nothing to do with cannabinol, the actual structure out of, out of, out of, uh, out of uh, marijuana, but it also hits the cannabinol receptor with higher potency than uh, the cannabinols. So uh, it's called synthetic marijuana. Phenethyl means, you know, we'll get back to that later. Oh, and there's the neurotransmitters we'll talk about later as well. Oh, and the action of <laughs> acetylcholine esterase. One of the neurotransmitters, this biological activity has to do with ester hydrolysis, which is important, I think. Yeah, and so let's go back uh, to the board here and look at another application uh, to catch your attention here on the amines. So here's a couple of aromatic nitro compounds that we need to talk about. <laughs> so this goes back to electrophilic aromatic substitution maybe. The para product here can be purchased, 20 bucks buys 100 grams. That's a lot of material, very cheap material. 30 bucks uh, for the ortho one also buys 100 grams. What's up with the meta here? So the meta nitro toluene, 100 grams is 500 bucks. So there's something about how this is made, right? That must make that more expensive. So the economics have an issue there. Let's look at the synthesis and maybe a do around compared to the reactions we already know there of why that's important. Now, butylamine, we just saw that in the hall of shame, right? Why is it shameful? And why do you put lemon juice on most seafood? Now that's kind of a, a hint there as to this issue that's going on. Seafood as it decays, in fact, all natural materials as they decay animal-wise are degraded by different bacteria and fungi. And one of the pungent compounds given off by de decaying biological tissue is this butylamine. And in its neutral form, you see, it's uh, quite volatile, it has a high enough vapor pressure that you have a very significant odor here. <laughs> Okay, and in fact, if you have the diamine version, those are called cadaverine and putrescine, which are even more foul uh, as far as their odor goes. So how do we deal with this odor? 
Well, uh, seafood, and depending on how fresh your fish is, nowadays most seafood is very fresh. The supply chain is very good. They get it to the market or the restaurant, and you don't notice the odor. But the tradition is you always squeeze lemon juice on seafood. Why? Just for the fun of it? Or do we like the taste of citric acid or the citrus out of a lemon? No. What happens here? Right, this is citric acid. So we've got some acid there. And what happens in the presence here? Oh, we're just reminding you about this, right? Well, what about the properties there? Yeah, this acid's strong enough to protonate that. And once it's protonated here, what? This is the conjugate acid salt of that. Now that doesn't have an odor, so no smell. <laughs> so this helps mask the unpleasant odors that might come off of your seafood here. And why? This is a salt now. Its vapor pressure is very low or non-existent. And if I had a rotten fish here, I could demonstrate that by opening up a uh, trout that's maybe a month old <laughs> and then squirting some lemon juice on it. You notice a significant decrease in that odor, but this relates to this property here. Okay, enough of that. What about this economic issue here? How are we gonna deal with this? Well, let's take the cheap one, which is this one here, and let's first uh, reduce that with 10 HCl, and we're gonna see why the meta one is so expensive. Well, you already know from the chemistry we've been talking about here, you can't do Friedel crafts on nitrobenzene. It's just too slow, so you can't do it directly there. And you can't nitrate toluene at the meta position. The alkyl is an ortho para direct, right? So don't forget about uh, those directing group effects. That probably has something to do with the price. So how many steps does it take? Let's see, first we reduce this nitro, which is cheap, right? The para nitro one, down to the para uh, methyl aniline version now. And now we treat that with acetyl chloride and pyridine. And what's that reaction? Well, that's an acylation. Here's the most reactive derivative, right? And now we form the amide, okay? Now the amide still has a lone pair there, so you might think, well, no Friedel crafts here on a neutral uh, aniline and no Friedel crafts on the nitro, but what about Friedel crafts on an amide? Well, the lone pair here is still available to go in and activate the ortho and the para positions. Here we only have the ortho positions, right? So you can nitrate that, so nitric acid, Sulfuric acid gives us the uh, ortho nitro uh, acetate, acid amide, sorry, with the methyl group there. Okay, so we got three groups on there, so it's quite a few steps. But now at least you see what? Nitro and methyl, that's what we need for the meta product here. We just need to get rid of this amide now, right? <laughs> So, yeah, sorry, it's a couple more steps. KOH, water, that's a way to uh, hydrolyze the amide back to the aniline. The nitro just stays there, as does the methyl, right? So now we have the ortho nitro paramethyl uh, aniline. And now what do we do? We treat with HONO, <laughs> nitrous acid. Oh, no, another reaction. Okay. Uh, it's going to form the diazo salt here. And what do we have? We have the nitro is okay. The diazo salt will look like that. Okay. We can actually isolate that. If it's sodium chloride, or if we use some HCl in there, it'll be the uh, chloride salt, the aryl diazo. And those are stable. You can actually isolate those. And the N2 plus looks kind of funny, but that's the aryl diazonium uh, salt here. And then one of the reactions to do this is hypophosphorus acid, H3PO2. It's kind of a funny looking reagent, but that reaction there gives us this final desired product, putting the hydrogen there, okay? And there's our meta nitro uh, toluene that costs so much more than the other nitro toluenes. And why? Well, how many steps does it take? The cheap one has to go one, two, three, six, seven, eight uh, steps there to, to get to that. But, uh, but they're all high yielding and all useful there. You just have to operationally handle some other things. So it gives you an idea of why that reaction is important that we're going to cover. All right, let's look at the amines in general and their structures. A little bit on naming now. 
the reactions, like I said, except for the aryl diazonium salts, the reactions we've really seen before, even the Gabriel synthesis isn't going to be that much of a stretch here, but uh, they all relate to ammonia, okay, which, you know, is not an organic compound, <laughs> but if you have a primary amine here, you've got one of the hydrogens replaced with, uh, with an alkyl, okay? And so, you know, still three bonds to nitrogen, still a lone pair there, but we call that primary amine. Why? Because it has one carbon on it. And then we have the secondary amines, which have two on there, and the tertiary, which have three. Okay, still neutral, still have a lone pair. Is that the end of the story? Well, I wish it was. <laughs> There's one more. You can have four on there. Ah, but now we don't have a lone pair, and if there's four bonds to nitrogen, that's a plus charge, okay? We call those the quaternary ammonium salts, okay? And yeah, they are salts, because they are uh, quaternary, four bonds to the nitrogen there. Okay, they all re react with acids, right, to go to uh, whatever they are. To, to that, and you know, we can analyze that pKa depending on what this acid is here. Let's say it's from HCl. Okay, pKa here is about nine, right? And HCl is what minus seven <laughs> pKa wise. So what's nine minus or minus seven? So the K for this reaction is ten to the sixteenth power. <laughs> so yeah, HCl, all the strong acids, irreversibly and completely protonate the amines. Uh, to that position. So anything actually under nine can, can protonate it, right? What about acetic acid? The simple carboxylic acid. Well, yeah, it's pK is nine. So what would be the K for that? Well, that's nine minus five. So your K here is what? Four. Still very favorable, okay? So carboxylic acids on their own with the amines are, are strong enough to go to the ammonium salts. So keep that in mind. How about the structure of the amines? Well, the key feature, I think, is uh, the lone pair. That's where the reactivity is, right? They are all basic. Uh, the electronegativity here is 2.8. So we can compare this lone pair to the lone pairs on oxygen, right? And I'm drawing this to scale now. Why? This lone pair is very big. <laughs> These are SP, what, three hybrids? Both of these, we're comparing ethers and alcohols, you can say, to the amines here. But this is 2.8 on the Pauling scale. What's oxygen? 3.5. So these lone pairs are held very tight on oxygen, which means what? These guys are far less basic than the amines. The amines being 2.8, these lone pairs are held less closely, right? That's the electronegativity, the tendency to draw electrons to themselves. So the nitrogens being less electronegative means that these are more available and these are bases, okay? This is not a base. If we protonate that, what do we get? Here we get pK9 if we protonate. If we protonate an oxygen here, we get hydronium ion. And what's the pK there? Minus two, which means what? Super strong acid, which means what? Super weak base, okay? Keep that in mind. And so a pKa of 9 here means what? This is a lot less acidic, which means what? This was much more basic than that. Okay, so those reverse uh, connections, I think, are important there. What about chirality here? <laughs> we need to talk about that just a little bit here on a mean. So let's say these were all four different groups. Four different groups? Do we count the lone pair as a group? Yeah, we can, right? This would be a tetrahedral structure, right? Your bond angle here, not quite 109.5, I think it's 107 for the bond angle. And why is that the lone pair has a little more uh, repulsion there electronically, which pushes those angles down a little bit. But we still say it's sp3 hybridized, right? Um, now, what do we mean about chirality here? These are four different ligands. And, you know, we could draw the mirror image here, and it would not be superimposable on that. So can we have these two different enantiomeric forms of amines? Not easily. Okay. It's because of tunneling effect. 
this lone pair can tunnel under here <laughs> and give us the uh, opposite uh, structure. It can flip that stereocenter, we say, uh, into that, which is the opposite uh, enantiomer of it. And this uh, barrier to flip between the two different forms, it just invert the sp3 uh, center there because it's just a lone pair there. Uh, that's only about five kcals per mole. So at room temperature, it's flipping back and forth. There's no way we can isolate this two, unless there's some other things. If you go to the quaternary monium salt and you have four different groups here, yeah, those can be chiral. This can be resolved into two enantiomers because it's not a lone pair flipping like, like the others here. And it's really only with tertiary amines and quats, not with secondary amines, right? Because <laughs> uh, the two groups there, well, if that was two different groups, well, with a smaller hydrogen, that, that flipping's even easier to do. And then, of course, here, there's two of the same. Okay, so it's not a big issue. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Let's get into a little bit on naming on amines. Uh, they're called alcanamines. And that's very similar to the alcanamid thing we've already done. You take the E off and add uh, amine. Or the simple way to name them is alkyl amine. And there actually is a space there. Okay, so the simpler amines are usually named this way. This is the IUPAC name for an alkyl amine. So... What would this be? Yeah, I'm not even going to write it. That's methanamine. Okay, and then this one here would be what? Triethylamine. Okay. Um, yeah, if it's just three simple groups and they're all the same, trialkylamine. There, that's the uh, standard way to do it. We've already seen this one. Diisopropylamine. Okay. If they're a little more complicated here, then there are ways to, to name them uh, systematically. But even this one, so here's allyl ethyl methylamine. And that's how you'd name it, just allyl uh, ethyl. And the different groups, methyl, space, and then amine. Okay. Now let me show you the IUPAC way. If you do have a more complicated one that has a difficult uh, arrangement, that may not be straightforward here. Yeah, you could call this, you know, cyclopentyl uh, ethyl methylamine. But for the IUPAC name, if you have uh, a, a larger structure here, that becomes the parent then, okay? So cyclopentyl pentanamine where you take the E off of pentane, right? And cyclopentanamine is the parent. And then on the nitrogen, you have N-ethyl, uh, okay? And then uh, N-methyl, uh, okay? And those are similar to the amide names that we saw before, okay? The alcanamids, where you have a parent here that's the big one, and then the N, N uh, alkyl. And that's probably all we need to say on, on nomenclature there. There are a couple of cyclic ones to be aware of or review. And we've already seen these before. So aniline, I've been using the name. <laughs> I expect you to know that, of course. And then if the nitrogen's in the benzene ring, uh, I think you know that one, pyridine. And let's see a couple others. Parole. We talked about these when we looked at aromaticity. These lone pairs are important. Here's an sp2 lone pair. And here's a lone pair in a p atomic orbital, right, to make it part of the aromatic group. And that's a parole. <clears throat> and then we have pipiridine. Uh, And that is actually part of the structure of the alkaloid compound in black pepper, <laughs> the peppery tasting compound, pepiridine. I think that's uh, part of the Latin term for where pepper actually comes from. And then we have pyrrolidine, which is related to parole. Yeah, and so we have pyridine related to pepiridine and parole related to pyrrolidine. These are different, right? These are aromatic up here. These are not aromatic. 
These are secondary amines, okay? <laughs> these are very basic, these two here, being just alkyl amines. These, uh, and that one, how, are, how, how basic are those? So we need to get into a, a little PKA stuff. On the properties of, of amines, yeah, they can hydrogen bond, not as good as alcohols, but they can all hydrogen bond and that helps them uh, with their water solubility. And there are polar bonds here. So yeah, they are considered polar functional groups. Um, well, let's look at preparation, reactivity here. So we can take ammonia itself and react it with primary bromide. Okay, so what does that go to? Well, it goes to the ethyl amine. Okay. Well, maybe we need to back up here and look at the mechanism. What does it go to actually initially here? It goes to the ammonium bromide, okay? That's the intermediate. How do we get to the neutral uh, primary amine here? Well, yeah, we need more ammonia, okay? So we actually need excess here to get this to go efficiently. Is that the end of the story though? No, the primary, uh, I mean, can go with more, right? And and use uh, the base to deprotonate here. And we can go to what? Di alkylamine, the secondary, okay? In fact, that reaction is difficult to control, to have it stop here. How would we get it to stop at the primary mean? Well, we just use enough uh, excess, you could say, of uh, the ammonia and we'd get it to stop there. But if we have a, an equal amount of the halide, one-to-one stoichiometry, it actually keeps going here because the primary amine, the alkyl group, is actually an electron donor, which makes this lone pair even more reactive. You could say, sterically, it would make it less reactive, but the electronic effect of the alkyl is important there, and you get a lot of secondary amine, even if you try to control the equivalence of the ethyl bromide. And that's not the end of the story, right? You can get <laughs> triethylamine. <laughs> and that's not the end of the story either. You can keep going here to tetraethyl ammonium bromide. Okay, this tetraethyl ammonium bromide, is that the end of the story? Yes, <laughs> okay. Now if you use excess of the uh, ethyl bromide, you're gonna favor that, okay? So excess of the amine, yeah, lets you stop at the primary. You'll still get a lot of secondary and some tertiary. I'll show you the solution uh, to dealing with that in a second. But the alkylation approach is limited. But again, if you use excess ammonia, uh, it's okay if you draw the primary amine product. If you say excess of the ethyl uh, bromide in this case, you'll favor that. So stopping at these other spots is, is tricky in that regard. So let's show another synthesis here. You can take this one and say excess ammonia, and yeah, you'd be okay with that product, okay? Yeah, and you know, you can adjust the pH and get whatever you want. If you want the ammonium uh, butyl group, you can, you know, at lower pH. Uh, higher pH, you can keep it there. And you are at higher pH here. Ammonia itself is basic. So that will tend to favor deprotonation of the intermediate here, okay? But that reaction would be okay to show on a quiz or, or a test. How about this one? Let's take uh, longer chain chloride and let's use methylamine. So here we're starting with the primary amine, okay? And we're gonna use excess of it. And what would be our product in this case? Well, we can get the secondary amine here, uh, which has the methyl already on it, and yeah, that would be okay. You see the excess base here would deprotonate your ammonium salt intermediate and would give you, give you that product there. Okay, yeah, and so these work fine, these alkyl groups, primary is best, secondary can work to some extent, and tosylates can also uh, work there. So other leaving groups that are similar to halides are fine. Well, what if you want a solution to getting away from the idea of having to use excess of your amine here. Um, and this over alkylation problem, if you have these simple halides, methyl and ethyl, 
which will easily overalkylate. Well, your solution here is the Gabriel synthesis. Gabriel was a chemist and he came up with this approach. He used this thal imid reagent. Uh, thal imid comes from phthalic acid, pH TH compound. <laughs> Uh, for the name there. It's an imid in that it has two acyl groups on the amine. And this reagent is a solid, a nice, well-behaved material. And you can take that with one equivalent of hydroxide. And this is the great thing about this. Uh, this is a irreversible, complete deprotonation. Now, why do we say that? Irreversible and complete. Well, what's the pKa of this? Well, it turns out it's about eight. <laughs> pKa of water, which will be our byproduct, is 15. So you see you're definitely going to the side of the weaker acid here. Why is this so low, eight, taking that off? Normally uh, an amine or ammonia itself, the pKa there is 38, right? This is not ammonium, this is the neutral amine. Oh yeah, it's the two acyl groups. And that will give you two lone pairs here with a negative charge. So why the low pK? Right, we've got delocalization into the two lone pairs. So it's like malonate or acetoacetate in between two carbonyls, okay? In fact, you can take this and put that salt in a bottle too, okay? Either way. And then you take this salt form. Now you dump in your uh, halide, primary, secondary, and what? That's a good, stable, charged nucleophile. So what type of reaction is this? Yeah, SN2, okay? And with a charged nucleophile, it's even better. These yields can be very good. You get the N-alkyl uh, phthal imid product. Okay, well, what, what's up with this? We don't really want that reagent. Well, there's another step here, uh, hydrazine. We saw hydrazine actually before too. Anybody remember where we saw hydrazine? Right, the Wolf-Kishner rejection of aromatic ketones. That and base and, and uh, hydrazine uh, reduced those aromatic ketones to the aromatic alkyl without rearrangements. Okay, so we've seen hydrazine before. Hydrazine in this case will function as a nucleophile. It'll do some acyl transfers here and some proton transfers I'm not going to go through the whole mechanism, but I'll show you the products. There's two products. This hydrazine gets diacylated, okay? And let's see, there's two hydrogens on there from the hydrazine. Where'd the other two go? Well, they end up on the amine. And I'm not going to go through that mechanism, but it's only the primary amine, okay? Even if you use excess of the halide, of, of the alkyl halide at this point, you only get one alkylation. Why is that? You've got a lone pair on this intermediate. Why isn't it just like the amines where you can overalkylate there? Right, this lone pair is tied up in resonance toward both carbonyls. So it only does one SN2 reaction, okay? And it stops at that point. Then you treat with hydrazine or you can use uh, KOH there you won't get the diacyl uh, hydrazine. You'll get the phthalic acid. You can actually recycle both of these back to the phthal imid, okay? Uh, but the clean thing is here, your product from the transfer, the acyl transfer of the hydrazine, gives you the hydrazine phthal imid and the primary amine, okay? And it's just the primary amine in pure form. So especially if you have a precious alkyl halide with a lot of functionality here and other stuff, and you want to use just the one equivalent and cleanly convert that into a primary mean, you use the Gabriel synthesis, okay? So it's not much of a difference. These steps here just combine the carboxylic acid derivative steps we've already seen. And here it's just more alkylation similar to the amines, okay? But if you want to cleanly get that in pure form, uh, you need to use the Gabriel uh, synthesis in order to do that. All right, there are other ways to make amines. You already know some of them. Let's review a couple of them. Uh, not going to go through mechanisms here, but we just saw this one, aromatic nitros. 
having that nitro group on there. How do we get rid of that? Well, 10 HCl is the one we just showed you. Or what? Hydrogen, palladium, or platinum. <laughs> Actually, a lot of transition metals will catalyze hydrogenation here. And what do we get? The aromatic aniline. Okay. And those are very different compounds, right? This is a strong activator of benzene, <laughs> the lone pair here. Whereas the nitro has a plus charge and a negative charge. The plus charge is right on the benzene, so that's a deactivator, okay? <laughs> so it's a way to convert in between the two, the aromatic amino. We can take cyanides or esters or amides or acid chlorides. There's a bunch of other <laughs> carboxylic acid derivatives here we can treat with LAH and go to what? The, uh, the amine. Primary amine, uh, I'm sorry, or amides. <clears throat> yeah, if we have an acid chloride or an ester, we go to the primary alcohol with a LH. We want to show amine synthesis, and that's with cyanides or amides with LAH. You got to quench with water here to get the thing there, but, but it's a way to make that. Uh, how about imines? Now, we've made imines before when we've had what? A primary amine, right? Or ammonia. So primary amine or ammonia with aldehydes or ketones goes to the imine, right? You need to have the two hydrogens there. It has to be primary in order for you to isolate that. But we can take this imine here and do what to it to get to an amine? And these are more functionalized amines. So this reaction is very important, I would say. Yeah, hydrogenation, which we're just showing up there. This is a pi bond, after all. Let's hydrogenate it. So what would we get? We get the the uh, the uh, amine there. All right, there's a way to do this uh, in one step and avoid using the the hydrogen approach, and that's and that's uh, reductive amination. Let me just introduce this topic, and then we'll pick it up right here next time. Let's Think about this, where we have a carbonyl compound and a primary. In fact, this works with secondary also, okay? And our intermediate here is what? Before we take the proton off, it still is on there, and it will be an aminium ion. Now, an aminium ion is cationic. It's susceptible to reduction, not with hydrogen, but with hydride. So what are the hydride reagents we've now? Sodium borohydride, but now we're going to use sodium cyanoborohydride. And we can abbreviate this, right, as sodium BH3 cyanide. Sodium cyanoborohydride. Now you have to have this cyano group on here in order to do this reaction. So mechanistically, it's a little bit tricky. But here, right, this is electrophilic right there. This can accept hydride and then push the electrons up. And look, you go directly to the amine product. Look at that. So there you go. And you see, why does it work with secondary also? Because if you have a secondary amine, you still have the ability to form the aminium. You can't form the stable imine, but you'll have the aminium from the secondary amine, which is susceptible to the sodium cyanoborohydride. In fact, this can be used in the same reaction pot. You put this together with the amine and the sodium cyanoborohydride, and it goes all the way to this. We call this reductive amination. Okay, Reductive in that we're using a hydride reagent, and it gives the amine product. You cannot use sodium borohydride, though. If you just use sodium borohydride in the presence of a ketone or aldehyde, it goes directly to the alcohol. <laughs> Why does sodium cyanoborohydride do the reduction of the aminium ion? That's a good question, and maybe we'll leave that uh, to let you think about that and uh, look in the book carefully and come up with a reason. Why does sodium cyanoborohydride do reductive amination, whereas sodium borohydride just does simple reduction in the presence of an amine and a ketone? Okay, <laughs> so stay tuned for that. 
And uh, yeah, we have a couple more sessions here, obviously, with chapter 25, but test three is coming up. So make sure you're caught up on your reading there and keep in mind uh, the uh, things coming up assignment-wise. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.